There was it, yeah. But that, but then you said, listen, at least do the text of the confession. I said, okay, I can do that. I can do that. Okay, uh, we'll be uh, starting here. We are on uh, week 19 of our uh, Sunday school series. Chapter 14 of your confession, if you'd like to make your way there. This chapter is named wonderfully of saving faith so i will pray and then we will get into our study lord god uh, we thank you for this day that you uh, by your providence brought us all safely here and we pray for our brothers and sisters who uh, will be joining us uh, later for the worship service that you would bring them also safely uh, through the high waters uh, to your uh, church to your body uh, that we would be able to celebrate and worship you in spirit and in truth. So, uh, Lord, I pray that you would bless this teaching, that we would have a deeper and greater understanding, and with that understanding, a deeper and greater love for you. In all these things we pray, Christ's name, amen. So, if you have your confession, if you would turn to chapter 14, uh, though if you don't have your confession, we have handy-dandy confession on the TV. If, if we go to the next slide. Oh, 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 oh look at that. Ah. The wonders of modern technology, huh? Okay. Paragraph one. The grace of faith enables the elect to believe so that their souls are saved. It is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts. Faith is ordinarily produced by the ministry of the Word. By this same ministry and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer and other means appointed by God, faith is increased and strengthened. So uh, in your notes, if you see it there, the first subheading is faith as the work of the Spirit. Faith as the work of the Spirit. Saving faith is a gift granted by the Spirit to the elect. I want to add here also quickly that faith in itself has one chief function, that being the salvation of souls. Uh, We can see this in the text of the confession. The grace of faith enables the elect to believe so that their souls are saved. Um, Many people will speak of having more faith or having greater faith so that you can do X, Y, or Z. Um, And they speak of faith almost as a substance or a quantity which you need to accrue more of. And when you have more of it, you can do more things. You know, they almost treat it as a resource or as as a money, as it were that you have X amount of faith and then you trade in that faith for you know, a new car or a new house or something like that. Uh, that's nothing like that is, is true here. Um, instead, the function of faith is that our souls would be saved. That is the goal of the grace of faith. And it is wonderfully a gift. Again, granted by the Spirit. We want to emphasize that by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. We are sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise. Um, If you ever want to look at something, which we've talked about a number of times, our brother Aiden and I, as we've been teaching, we look at something known as the economy of salvation or the economy of the Trinity, that each member of the Trinity does a unique and special action, performs a unique and special action within our salvation. So the Father chooses and elects, the Son dies for and sheds his blood for, and then the Holy Spirit seals and uh, is, is the mark of our inheritance, the pledge of our inheritance, that whole description, what I just said, that whole statement, is essentially found in the opening chapter of Ephesians, starting in verse 3 through to 14. You see each member of the Trinity doing their own function there for our salvation. It's a wonderful thing and, and beautiful to read. 2 Corinthians 4.13 is another verse which we have, uh, speaking of faith as the work of the Spirit. But having the same Spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. 
We also believe, therefore we speak. Um, wonderful to hear the Holy Spirit named the spirit of faith, also the spirit of obedience, uh, the spirit of Christ, all of these things. The Holy Spirit of promise, as it says in Ephesians 1. Uh, so all of these things we can view as our faith being the work of the Spirit. Any questions on that before we move on? Oh, wonderful. Now we have in our notes the ordinary means of grace. I did talk about this um, at, at some length uh, a couple of weeks ago. Does anyone remember what the three ordinary means of grace are? No? Okay. Oh, let's see. My dad's pulling up his notes. He's checking his notes. All right. This is open. This is open book test. This okay, guy. This is all right. The three ordinary means of grace. Aiden's not allowed to answer. No, you're not allowed to answer. Yeah, yeah. So they were mentioned last week. Obviously, I mentioned them a couple of weeks ago. All right. So just a little bit longer. Okay. Well. Anything, Dad? Means of grace. Means of grace. Mm -hmm. Okay, look at there. One gold star, Brian Nutt. The three ordinary means of grace, which they are again listed here in our confession. The second uh, line, or the second sentence, faith is ordinarily produced by the ministry of the word, the preaching of the word. And then mentioned here again in the final sentence, by this same ministry and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which are the sacraments, and then prayer. Those, those three are the ordinary means of grace. This is how God ordinarily blesses his people, granting them salvation and continued sanctification. I have it in my notes too, by the way. Oh, good. Oh, good. So, so I don't want to get a <laughs> complex or anything. Right oh, good, good. <laughs> Gold Star Ross as well. Gold Star Ross as well. Well, no. <laughs> so the preaching of the word, sacraments, and prayer. These three means of grace, and again, ordinary means of grace. This doesn't mean God cannot bless us in anything outside of that. Um, we can think in our own lives of other means of grace, means by which God blesses us. Uh, Christian fellowship would be a massive one, of course. Um, time in service would be an excellent one as well. Um, all of these things, uh, individual devotion um, and, and time in the Word, all these things are means of which God blesses us. But these three means are the pillars of the church and are meant to be great feasts enjoyed by the whole of the local church. Hebrews chapter 10 uh, verses 19 through 25 is a wonderful uh, lead-in as we begin to look at paragraph 2, which outlines some of the conduct of the person who has saving faith. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us, through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let me pause here. This section of Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 22, speaks to this salvation. Okay, we've been uh, sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. We can draw near with a sincere heart. All of these things because we can enter now and draw near to God through Christ. Um, does that make sense before we continue on with the rest of Hebrews 10? Okay, so Hebrews 10 there is setting up why we can now live in a new way. Starting in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25 here, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, uh, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
So a very simple, what is the conduct? What does the Christian life look like in a very simple way? Verses 23 through 25 of Hebrews 10 tells you there. We should be stimulating one another to love and good deeds. We had hold fast to our confession, which is not referring to the 1689 necessarily, but the confession of Christ as Lord and Christ as the sacrifice on our behalf. Okay, everything which the writer of Hebrews, the, the pastor here, has been preaching in his sermon, all of that is our confession, and not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Is that good for everyone before we move on to paragraph two? Okay, very good. Paragraph two, if you'd like to put down a, a kind of subheading or an also known as, the second paragraph can be looked at as the whole of the conduct of the new life. Okay, we've received a new life. Our souls have been saved through the gift of saving faith. And now we have a new way in which we live. Let me read, and then we'll get into it. By this faith, again, this saving faith, Christians believe to be true everything revealed in the word recognizing it as the authority of God himself. They also perceive that the word is more excellent than every other writing and everything else in the world, because it displays the glory of God in his attributes, the excellence of Christ in his nature and offices, and the power and fullness of the Holy Spirit in his activities and operations. So they are enabled to entrust their souls to the truth believed. They respond differently according to the content of each particular passage, obeying the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and the one to come. But the principal acts of saving faith focus directly on Christ, accepting, receiving, and resting upon him alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. That was a mouthful. Let's begin to quickly unpack it. Your first subheading under paragraph two is titled Renewing of the Heart. And this is what happens first. This is what happens first. Kind of in the order of the Christian life, now that we're there. The Spirit does a work in the heart of the Christian to cause us to believe and love God and His Word. So we can think of Romans chapter 7, which I know Brother Aiden, I'm sure, talked about last week. Uh, considering it's one of the best passages for the doctrine of sanctification. But in Romans 7, Paul, speaking of his pre-Christian life, he speaks of not loving the law. He didn't love God's ways. But now that he is saved, he has a love for those ways. Also, Ezekiel 36, 26, a wonderful verse. Really, I mean, the whole of Ezekiel 36 is great because it's speaking mostly about the, the new covenant, new covenant promises. And Ezekiel 36, 26, the writer says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So we see this translation happening in our own hearts when we get saved. And then if you would turn, please, to Daniel chapter 4. We can see this wonderfully in action. Daniel chapter 4. This would be King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar has a vision of this massive tree which has grown. Uh, and then uh, it's, it's beautiful, its fruit is abundant, it's, it's you know, the greatest tree ever, basically. Um, but then there's an angel that comes, also translated as an angelic watcher. Uh, he comes and decrees, chop down this tree. Um, and so he has this dream, and the king then calls Daniel and says, can you interpret this for me? And Daniel's response is, uh, yeah, I wish this was going to happen to your enemies and not you, because this is no good. But this is what's going to happen. Because you have magnified yourself, because you've glorified yourself, God is going to humble you, essentially. And that, that happens. Uh, the vision gets fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar is walking on the roof of the, royal uh, of the royal palace, 
of Babylon, and he basically says, who, who, who is better than me? I, I'm the best. This empire is amazing. And then immediately there's a voice from heaven, and he gets humbled. And so then he starts roaming among the animals. He lives as an animal for a period of time. And then we find ourselves in verse 36, or verse 34. But at the end of that period, that period of humbling, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. So there we see a, a first-hand account of this change. You know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is obviously not a Christian. He obviously does not love God or his ways. Um, and he is humbled. But then at the end of that period, he looks towards heaven. And by the language, he's, he's praising God. He's glorifying him. He has a, a love and a devotion now that he's been humbled. Um, and that is, in a, you know, a micro sense, what happens to our life. We may not be Nebuchadnezzar, the probably most powerful man in the world at the time, uh, but we are a spiritual Nebuchadnezzar, as it were. So that is the renewing of our heart. And it isn't necessarily really talked about in the second paragraph, but it is important to know that that, that does happen. Our heart is renewed. And then we have what is next in your subheading, the renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind. Just as the Spirit did a work in our hearts, He also does a work in our minds. The Spirit does a work in the mind of the Christian to cause us to understand the ways of holiness and desire the things of God. The verse that we should think of and turn to when we hear the phrase renewing the mind is going to be Romans 12. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. And Paul, for the first 11 chapters of Romans, has done a great amount of teaching, both in quantity and quality and depth. But now in uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he starts off with, therefore, it basically in light of everything which I've told you, the teaching, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we want to break this idea of renewing the mind into two sections, two categories. The first would be to, per, to understand holiness. We see this in our confession perceive that the word is more excellent than every other writing and everything else in the world. It's from this paragraph, the uh, second sentence. They also perceive that the word is more excellent than every other writing and everything else in the world. Uh, if you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read quite a lot of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Starting in verse 4, we'll read this kind of in chunks to read the parts which are pertaining to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just take a brief water. There we are. And we'll be picking up in verse 18 now. 
For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that you were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things uh, of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Uh, wonderful writings here from the Apostle Paul. Also, Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. I won't uh, make you listen to my uh, reading of that, but that's carrying on the same idea. Again, this the understanding of holiness. The person who is not saved cannot understand the things of God. Okay, To the person who is not saved, it is foolishness. It's a stumbling block. It doesn't make sense to them. But to us, to those who are being saved, Paul writes there in verse 18, it is the power of God. So, in the renewing of our mind, first we are enabled to understand holiness. The second thing, the second part of renewing the mind is a desire for the things of God. A desire for the things of God. And this is made up of a couple different elements. The first would be entrusting souls to truth believed. This is directly from uh, our confession. So they are enabled to entrust their souls to the truth believed. This is not a thing an unsaved person would, would do. They wouldn't, you know, entrust things to a, a being which they cannot see. You know, we, we hear this in the rhetoric of modern atheists in America. Oh, you just have a sky daddy who just lives up in the clouds. Well, I mean, yes, but no, like it's not, it's not that simple, right? It's, it's a lot more. Yeah, my, my heavenly father does live in the heavens, right? But it's not this kind of childlike foolishness that you're making it out to be. It is a foolishness of God, okay? It does not make sense from a rational mind that the king of glory would condescend to be a man to die on a cross which he would have built by men that he made to then rate, come back to life all for the express purpose of saving men who rejected him, who hated him, whose sins he bore. That is foolishness in the world. It doesn't make sense. But to us, what I just said is the most wonderful truth which we can hold, which we entrust our souls to. The second part, or one of the other major factors in desiring the things of God, would be study of the Bible. Uh, we see this clearly in the confession, that they respond differently according to the content of each particular passage. That they obey commands that when warnings and threatenings are given in the text, they say, whoa, all right, let me, let me be a little bit more careful here. They respond. They embrace the promises of God. And all this comes only from actively studying the Bible. And then the third really major part, which we love our, as our affections are changed, is we are... a joined to a local body. We're joined to a local body. This is comprised of many things. Um, one of them being Sunday school. Thank you for being here. Another one, regular attendance in the Lord's Day. Uh, corporate worship, public worship. Uh, when we do, like Wednesday nights, 
attendance for those, all of these things, a desire to do those things and actively be a part of the body. We don't just attend for an hour on uh, the Sunday worship and then just check that box and you're good for all of it. No, we, we are a part of a body. We, we meet regularly and as often as we can make it. A couple of verses concerning this. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, obviously. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I don't know about you guys. I'm looking forward to breaking bread after, after the service. I have a nice potluck as good Baptists. And then one of my very favorite verses, Psalm 122, uh, verse 1. It is titled A Song of Ascents. Um, in this section of the Psalms, there's a number of Psalms about going up and making a, pil a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So when, when they're saying ascents, they're going up to the place. A Song of Ascents. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We should have a real joy when we we get together with our brothers and sisters for the Lord's Day, for, for Sunday school, for Wednesday groups, other meetings throughout the week. Any time we're able to be with brothers and sisters should be a great joy for us. I know it is for me. I, I, I like mark my week by the next time I get to be at church and, and see my, my family in the Lord. Any questions on this paragraph? Yes, sir. So that same joy is with the whole Yeah, yeah, so for sure. Yeah. 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 That would that would be uh, you know they they could be stifling or suppressing the Holy Spirit, um, or or they could they that could be an evidence that they're just not saved really. Um, if if you have to be dragged along to attend the Lord's Day to be with Christian brothers and sisters. I mean, you should be asking some personal questions there about, you know, hey, am I, do I love the things of God? Because again, when we are renewed, we will act differently. If we, we can't, you know, before we're Christians, you know, it makes sense to not want to go to church, right? But then when we're made to be Christians, we should change that behavior, right? Oh, dear. Um, if, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to church, right? <laughs> That's, that's the whole point of that Hebrews 10 passage, which I read before, was we have a new way of living because of all these things which Christ did, how he achieved salvation, how he, we enter now through the veil, which is his flesh, all of these things. And so there's a new way of living. So yes, good, good point, Wallace. Thank you. All right, paragraph three. Any other questions on this paragraph before we enter into our last one? No? Okay. All right, I think I'm making good time. I think. I'm... I'll find some way to add another 15 minutes to me talking. Oh, no, no, no? Okay. <laughs> this faith may exist in varying degrees so that it may be either weak or strong. Yet even in its weakest form, it is different in kind or nature, like all other saving graces, from the faith and common grace of temporary believers. Therefore, faith may often be attacked and weakened, but it gains the victory. It matures in many to the point that they attain full assurance through Christ who is both the founder and perfecter of our faith. Another quick water break. So here we have the differences between saving and temporary faith. I did talk about this briefly a couple of weeks ago in chapter 10. But, as is uh, oftentimes the case, I had to skip some things uh, to uh, end early, because I uh, always go long. But I'm going to reread uh, a sentence from uh, chapter 10, section 4. It'll be the second sentence, so it is here. They may even be called by the ministry of the Word and may receive some ordinary working of the Spirit without being saved. 
Okay, this is different than saving faith. Again, saving faith is reserved only for the elect. But there are some dis- some differences. First uh, John, chapter one. First John, chapter two. I lied. I'm sorry. Verses eighteen and nineteen. First John, chapter two, verses eighteen and nineteen. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. And here we want to make a note that Antichrist does not necessarily refer to one individual who is, you know, the supreme leader of all evil on earth and, you know, that that one person. But Antichrist just means people who are against Christ, Antichrist. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out, so that it would be shown they all are not of us. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 24. Matthew 7, 21 through 24. This is the kind of eerie and and spooky uh, warning of the Lord Christ, where he speaks, you know, he says, there will be many in the last day who will say, Lord, Lord, kurios, kurios, have I not done all these things in your name? Have I not preached? Have I not done miracles? Have I not done all these things in your name? And he will say, be gone from me, I never knew you. Be gone from me, I never knew you. And then, finally, we have Hebrews chapter 6. Verses 4 through 8. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those, for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorn and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. It is an important note which our confession makes in this chapter that saving faith is of a different substance and quality entirely than temporary faith. It says, yet even in its weakest form, it is different in kind or nature from the faith and common grace of temporary believers. You know, many people would ask, why, why does God grant a temporary faith to some people? And my answer is, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's sometimes a difficult thing for us to grasp and to reason with, but God does. This is how he works. But it is important to know that when we see people fall away, they went out from us when they were once with us, and sometimes we begin to question ourselves. Oh, well, I, I could be just like that person. Well, no. If you have a truly saving faith, you won't. You, you can't. Because the faith which you have is a different kind altogether. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Important there. And an interesting thought that the faith which you and I have, true saving faith, which results in all the fruits of the Holy Spirit, is the same faith, the same quantity, the same quality, all of these things, the same perfect faith, that Peter had, that Paul had, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point from Wallace. That you know, I am saying that it's a it's a great thought that we have the same kind of faith which Peter had, even though he saw the Lord Christ, lived with him for three years. But in, in a sense, Wallace, you're, you're right that we have a fuller faith because we have the whole of the New Testament. We have the whole of the Old Testament. These are some privileges which the early church didn't have for many hundreds of years. Uh, yeah, good point. That in a sense, we're we're better off here in America, right? Having we we may not have seen the Lord Christ and lived with Him for three years, but we have the full revelation of our Lord. And they also had a lot of superpowers. Yeah. Said, you know, we... Yeah. 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 I've never refer. I've never heard the apostolic gifts referred to as superpowers, but yeah, kinda, yeah. We should, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a good. That's a good point. All right, and then now we get into the last point in your notes, the last section: victorious faith. Victorious faith. Therefore, faith may often be attacked and weakened, but it gains the victory. I like how our confession speaks there. There's no. Uh, there's no extra words. There's no, uh, you know, well, m- maybe, you know, in, in, the, in the long run, you know, no, just, it may be weakened, it may be attacked often sometimes, but it gains the victory. Wonderful. This side of glory, our faith is always growing more and more and deeper and deeper. In all things, we desire to be more Christian. That's often a question that we should ask ourselves as often as we can think to ask ourselves, how can I be more Christian in this instance? Again, Christian, meaning initially it was a slur for our people, meaning little Christ. And they meant it as, oh, you're, you're just a little Christ, you're going to be hung like, a little, like, like Christ, which was often true. They would uh, hang uh, and crucify Christians in the early church. And uh, Nero would even then have them lit on fire and used as nightlights in the city of Rome. So it was an initially a slur. Uh, you little Christians, you'll, you'll die the same, you little Christs. But we wear that name as a sign of honor, as a badge of our king. How can we be more Christian? How can we be more Christ in this area? And this includes a victorious and assured faith. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. The pastor writes, And we desire that each of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. And then finally, Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. That their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself. Colossians 2.2. 2. And the one previously was Hebrews 6.11 and 12. Though, again, as the confession points out, it matures... There's varying degrees of strength of faith. It goes up and down. You're attacked and weakened. But hold on to it, and there is a victory. Because Christ does not lose. Our King does not lose. He only wins. He collects many W's and no L's, as the kids say. Yeah, I got that. That's good. That's a good one. Okay, let me end... With a, uh, if there, are there any questions for the lesson? Because I'm going to end with a Spurgeon quote, and then we're going to get out of here. Yeah. No. Okay. It was crazy. I had to uh, look through the Spurgeon quotes that I've used in the past because I don't want to recycle any. But there was a lot that I have used before that I could have used on this lesson. But I've got this one, which is wonderful. If you are renewed by grace and were to meet your old self, I am sure you would be very anxious to get out of his company. Charles Spurgeon. Let us read. Or let, us, well, let us read. Let us pray, and then uh, let's head on over. Uh, one, one last call for questions. Any questions? No. Okay. Ross and my dad, gold stars. Aiden minus one gold star.
It's true. Uh, let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity uh, that you give us to come together as our church family. Uh, Lord, we, we desire it. We, we love to be with our heavenly family, uh, all bound as one another uh, to one another by the blood of Christ, who is the very head of the body. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you not only uh, have made it available for us to study who you are and how you love us, what you do for us, but you command us to, you encourage us to, as we grow in knowledge and understanding of the foolishness of God in sending Christ to save us, we grow to a greater faith, a more perfect and full faith, a greater assurance and a greater victory. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless our pastor as he prepares and as he then preaches uh, the word. Uh, bless uh, Claire and our worship team uh, that we would worship well. Uh, bless each of us as we go from this place to love you more and as we know you more. And then uh, finally, bless our uh, meal that we will all share together in the breaking of bread and wonderful fellowship. We thank you uh, and we pray all these things in the name of the blessed Lord Christ. Amen.